The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Uh, we're back with another David, our vaccination data seminar series. Today, our guest is Dr. James Callen. He is the co-founder and CTO of Convex, a new uh, scalable backend startup that just been founded in the last year. Um, prior to that, he was a senior principal engineer at Dropbox, working on their database infrastructure. And uh, prior to that, he was a PhD student of Barbara Liskoff at MIT. And prior to that, he was ranked as the number one uh, Australian computer scientist uh, I think it was at 2009, 2008. Um, it was a very prestigious award. So with that, James, thank you for being here. It's, it's an honor. Go for it. Oh, I, I say it quickly. If everybody has any questions for James, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and, and ask your question. And feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation and not James talking to himself for an hour. Okay? Yep. James, go for and it. And thank you, Andy. Yeah, I, I really like the in-person talks where I get that interactivity. Uh, I may not see you on Zoom, uh, if I'm just in, in, the, in the zone. So feel free to just jump in and shout out. So um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to give a talk today about databases and infrastructure work we're doing at this company called Convex. And I'm going to talk specifically about how we're designing this to work for serverless developers, uh, for folks who don't want to run their own infrastructure or even have an infrastructure team. And at the time of this talk, we haven't even released our beta yet. Uh, so this is all very early stuff. And our beta is coming out in about a week or two. So feel free to sign up at convex.dev. Um, and given that it's very early stage, I'm gonna talk about some features that exist in our beta, some features that haven't been officially released yet, and some things will just stay kind of secret source uh, startup stuff. Um, so there's a lot of content to cover here. Most of this will be fairly high level, but also uh, quite technical by necessity. And I'm happy to dig in wherever if people wanna jump in with any questions. So who am I? Andy's already given a pretty good uh, intro. I'm a friend of Andy's, so perhaps there's some nepotism involved here, but I've got a lot of experience building some big infrastructure. Uh, did my PhD in distributed systems on, on a system called Granola on efficient large scale distributed transaction coordination. Um, we worked in consensus protocol work. Uh, and then at Dropbox worked in a lot of uh, really quite large infrastructure. So one of the big projects I led there was the migration of Dropbox's data off of Amazon S3 onto a system called Magic Pocket. There's a system that stores multiple exabytes of data. So it's, it's huge, uh, close to a million hard drives, uh, you know, a million separate addressable nodes um, and has never lost a byte of data ever. Very reliable system. It was a tech lead for metadata at Dropbox, including a system called Edge Store, which is a distributed database that runs millions of queries per second. And then also a tech lead for all persistent systems at Dropbox. So, caching, big data, data centers, uh, multi-homing the company. So I worked pretty extensively on designing um, and operating very large, very efficient and very re uh, reliable distributed databases, storage systems, and then I started a startup. So this talk is about how we can make databases that are more usable. And by more usable, I mean more easily accessible, able to be treated like an appliance. And really what are the barriers that get in the way of people who just wanna build stuff? And how can we make it easy for them to just build stuff? So I know these talks are meant to be technical and there's a lot of tech stuff that's going to come in this presentation. But the number one thing I was lacking when I was in grad school and studying distributed systems was actual real perspective of what's going on in the outside world and what people's challenges are. So I'm going to start with some of that. Uh, I used to do a lot of advising to other companies on the infrastructure, mostly for free. And I mentored a lot of senior engineers at tech companies and got to observe kind of what's going on within infrastructure teams at these big companies. And then I left and started a startup and did a bunch of market research and talking to smaller startups about what their needs and their challenges are. And in this process, I tended to encounter two archetypes of engineers. And the first architect, archetype I'm terming the enthusiast. And I primarily encounter these people because they would work with folks who are running database teams in various companies. And what characterizes this archetype is these folks were deeply into tech. They're oftentimes in the tech for tech's sake. So they had technical ambitions that sometimes outstripped their actual workload. So typically I'd chat with a team and they'd say, hey, we're building a distributed database or we're writing our own consensus protocol or we're going to migrate off of our existing MySQL instance and we're going to deploy a big cockroach deployment in our company. 
And then we chatted about what their, their use cases were and they were dealing with hundreds or thousands of queries per second or data sets under a terabyte. And mostly my advice was, hey, just stuff this stuff on a single you know, replicated Postgres instance on RDS, right? All of us are presumably these people because we're all on a databases call right now, right? But we have to be careful to build features that are actually relevant to the customers that we have and the organizations that we work in. And my feeling is that these systems is custom systems typically have a very high long-term maintenance cost. And most companies should not be building deeply custom infrastructure at all. They should be using something off the shelf. Um, but when I started looking around for business ideas post Dropbox, I encountered a different archetype. And these are people who just wanted to get shit done, right? They had an idea for a product, they wanted to build it and infrastructure was getting in their way. And interestingly, I found myself in that category. I just wanted to build stuff. And it was a real hassle for spinning up all this new infrastructure from scratch. And this category is growing really fast, really fast. So there's more, that, more teams than ever that are making software. They're laser focused on, cu on customer value. They don't really care about technology for technology's sake. And there's a growing appetite just to delegate complexity to off the shelf services uh, where they can. But when we go to these co companies and say, yeah, you know, what, what do you need right now? The, the, the message we often hear is something like, oh, we just really need someone to manage our Kafka cluster. And I'd be like, well, why are you even running Kafka? I don't know. Why do you have to have a Kafka cluster to begin with? And it was because of something silly, like it was a message queue because the database kept falling over because it had a bad connection pool implementation, which is a very common thing amongst databases. So what these two groups have in common is they're typically forced to deal with details that aren't really relevant at all to their business. Uh, and they're doing so fairly rationally because this is not possible to do otherwise. And so they don't have these clean abstractions that allow them to hide away the underlying complexity of data management and end up focusing on building stuff that's really quite tangential to the business they're actually in. So oftentimes I'll hear that, you know, I need control over my systems. I want to build a good product. I need to have tight control over my database, for example. And, you know, my retort is that this is really because there's a kind of a failure of, of clean abstractions in the database world. Um, you know, oftentimes I wonder how many users of Amazon S3 know how it stores its files. I'm going to say essentially zero, right? If the people just trust S3 to do its thing because it stores your files and then it just goes away, right? And most customers need databases that you know, store the data and then just go away. Um, so one of the most promising trends underway is this era of serverless computing that we're entering. And this might be quite a departure from how folks... Uh, on this call might think about how the next generation of developers are building their products. Right? So what is this serverless computing? I guess we could call it a revolution, but it's kind of on, under the way right now. Uh, so this is pioneered by companies like uh, Netlify and Vercel, and you can Google this jam stack architecture. Essentially developers are writing their web apps in JavaScript, right? They're being hosted in CDNs and they get kind of deployed with these deployment tools to CDNs. And then these, these CDNs basically host the website and any function execution happens on Lambdas. And there's actually no server running um, that the developer can perceive, right? There's a development workflow and then a CDN cluster talking to Lambdas. Um, and, you know, you see companies like FaunaDB has pivoted to now be like the serverless database. So Fauna's, you know, website is all about serverless. Systems like Firebase have done a great job in this space. And these systems work great for most static content. So Netlify, Vercel, et cetera, really great for fairly static websites, but it is not great for really dynamic content right now. So static content is a hassle. You have to identify it, it's a generated build time. And then when you want to do, use dynamic content, you have to play a bunch of tricks, like something called SWR. SWR stands for stale while revalidate. This is a technique that web developers use when rendering dynamic content. Basically, this means is just like show stale data to the user and then spawn a background thread that fetches new data. And if it's different, refresh it later on, right? This is obviously clumsy and, and obviously, obviously a hassle to deal with uh, in these systems. Uh, in my experience, the query languages that exist right now are really quite hard to use. Uh, no shade on say, on, say, Fauna, but I find FQL, the Fauna query language, you know, quite difficult to use. For me as a database person, I imagine um, more difficult for someone with no database experience. And one, one comment we hear all the time from Firebase customers, one is that Firebase customers tend to love Firebase, but they're always talking about the day they have to move off it, 
I was like, ah, oh, we, we really dread the day we have to move off Firebase. We know we're going to have to do it because there's no real schema support. The indexes are somewhat limited. It doesn't have a full relational model. doesn't play nice with the analytics, et cetera. So what primitives would we actually want um, in this ideal world of not having to understand how our database works? And I'm, I'm going to get into some tech details of how we actually implement these later on. So we need to support relatively complex transactions. We can't just provide a CRUD interface, you know, create, you know, read, update, delete. We need to support scans and filters and chain queries because if you don't support these relatively complex query primitives, developers are going to have to do so by a round trip to the backend. And that will be inefficient and force them to develop hacks to make it faster. It needs to be correct. And I know like correct is not a phrase you hear in database circles because it sounds so vague, right? You probably hear something like, um, isolation levels or um, snapshot and, you know, anomalies, et cetera, and phantoms. But um, all the developers care about is that their systems are correct, meaning the stuff that you show on the screen looks consistent, right? So basically we need to provide serializability or something similar that I have to think about. Caching needs to be integrated into the system. And if caching is not integrated, developers will have to build it themselves. And reasoning about caching is really quite hard. You have to reason about consistency, cache and validation, and all of a sudden the abstraction is broken. I used to always find it amusing that, you know, as database designers, you spend all this time building consistent systems, and then in practice, someone just slaps a memcache cluster in front of it, and it breaks all the guarantees, right? So you have this strongly consistent system in the background, and because it won't perform in practice, you're slapping memcache and losing all your guarantees. We have to have a gradual ramp up. The system has to be pretty approachable, right? Because people want to get started. They want something that works easily and just get, helps them get their stuff done. But it has to have a full feature set. So we can't have people migrating off the system because it doesn't have schema support or proper indexes or a relational model or schema migrations. And lastly, there needs to be an escape hatch. So a, a database can't be everything to everyone, right? And if you want to be taken seriously, there has to be a way to point your analytics platform at it or to run your SQL query if needed. This is a diagram, this is a horrendous slide. This is a, is a thing that's called Database and AI Landscape in September, 2020. And there's just an incredible number of systems in here. I'm sure by now there's double the number of systems in here. And you can't directly replace or directly integrate with all of these. So we need some common lingua franca, like a column store or SQL to allow easy integration with all the other platforms that companies need to use. So that brings us to Convex, my company. So Convex is designed to be reactive. Right? We want to support dynamic content, interactive applications, and you can't just support this by caching and CDNs. The queries in Convex are written in JavaScript. I'll talk a lot more about that. We execute, execute these queries on a multi-version concurrency control database backend. We provide automatic caching, subscriptions, um, invalidation, which I'll talk about more today as well. And we also provide incremental schema support, indexes, a fully relational model. Basically all the primitives I mentioned, unsurprisingly, because I wrote the primitives. So yeah, we support them all. <laughs> and a big selling point of this work is this very seamless integration on the client side, but I'm gonna focus on the back end in this talk. So at a very high level, it looks like this. This is just lifted from some of our documentation. Yeah, go Andy. You say queries and transactions in JavaScript. I mean, maybe, maybe this is, it's, so it's all store procedures. Store procedures, yeah. basically fancy store procedures. And I'm, I'll go through this in like two slides. And okay. if there's still questions, we'll come back. Yep. Right. Um, so, so basically the architecture looks roughly like this. So you have kind of JavaScript running in say Node.js, you know, it's getting served by Node.js and it's serving a React app. And that app, app talks to the convex client bindings, which call into the convex cloud, right? Where it executes functions, which are basically store procedures written in JavaScript and runs these on a database. So let's start with these functions to address Andy's question. This is their pretty core to the system. So the query model here is deterministic JavaScript. And queries look like this, but they can actually be a lot more complex. The queries can be thousands of lines long. They can import libraries. They can have dependencies, right? You write these big queries. And essentially at the end of the day, they use a DB object to talk to the database. So they can issue as many DB requests as they want in one function. They can write loops. They can read from a table and do some processing and write back to a different table. Um, so why JavaScript? Uh, well, we're targeting developers who want to build stuff without thinking about a backend. And these developers are writing their code in JavaScript or TypeScript. It's just the most popular language in the world right now. It's unlikely to change for quite a while. And so we want to meet the developers where they're at in the languages that they use. 
by using JavaScript, we can express complex queries, right? So we can express multi-phase queries. And if you can express complex queries, including data transformations and processing, you don't need to have multiple round trips to the back end. And avoiding interactive transactions is a huge win. You see, this, there's a lot of research about, about this kind of one-shot terminacy transactions because it allows us to avoid long-held locks or frequent OCC conflicts um, and also allows us to cache results very easily, which is something I'll talk about quite a bit in this talk. As an aside, um, we can support more languages by WASM, not something I'm going to talk about today. So the focus is going to be more on the JavaScript transactions. So why determinism? So we don't actually support vanilla JavaScript. We only support a deterministic subset of JavaScript. And we're putting some constraints on the developer to make these functions work. So why would we do this? Well, on the right side, it's great. Um, deterministic functions simplify transaction coordination. Right? If you have a deterministic store procedure, every node's going to do the same thing given the same serial ordering. Right? You can always reconstruct the state of the database given the series of, of functions that were called in a certain order. And the last three points on this slide are quite related. They've all involved reads, which is that um, deterministic functions allow us to freely reuse the query results or partial results safely. So we can reorder transactions provided there's no conflicts in read and write sets. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when it comes to subscriptions. And we're definitely not the first people to talk about why deterministic one-shot functions are good, right? There's tons of papers about this. I think my, my PhD thesis talked about this, Granola, um, Calvin works all about this kind of stuff. Um, so how do we actually make these functions deterministic? Well, first, let's talk about how we even run these transactions to begin with. Um, so you can think of these transactions like fancy store procedures. The client writes these functions, they take inputs, and you register the, the, the functions as source code with the backend. And the backend is written in Rust, it runs these queries in a V8 isolate, running in Rusty V8, um, which is the, you know, JavaScript and WebAssembly runtime. And so there's a client on the web browser in JavaScript. Um, it calls into a web server in Rust. Actually, I'll show you a diagram right now while we go through this might be easier, right? So the client in JavaScript here, it's a very simplified diagram. It talks to the, you know, it wants to run a function. It speaks to the convex client. It sends the HTTP request to our backend server. It speaks to the transaction engine. The transaction engine assigns a timestamp for the transaction. It reads the source code for the function, which happens to be stored in the same database that is being modified. Then it spins up a V8 runtime to actually execute that function. Um, and then uh, if there's any calls to talk to the database, that speaks back to the transaction engine, which communicates with the database, eventually commits it. And I'll talk more in detail about these as we go forward. So we look at this query again, this is that original query I showed you, the list messages query. This is a query that will show you basically all the messages in a chat channel. Uh, and this query could, as I said, could contain thousands of lines of code, but most importantly, whenever it calls db dot whatever, that's a call that breaks out of V8 and issues instructions to our transaction coordinator. So obviously JavaScript isn't deterministic. Right? You can read system time in JavaScript. You can access random numbers. Uh, there's, there's, there's types like weak ref, which can externalize garbage collection state. Um, so we have to fix this. And so time is pretty easy to fix. We just pick a war clock time for every transaction and patch in any calls to system time to give it that, that war clock time. Uh, we do a similar thing for random numbers. And then there's some things we just can't support. So we don't support weak ref, for example. Uh, but in general, we support a pretty comprehensive subset of JavaScript and it hasn't limited us or the, all the customers we work with in terms of what they can express. So I'll pause here real quick before I get into the transaction model. In case there's any questions here. I'll, I'll keep powering through. So as far as the transaction model goes, it's fairly standard multi-version concurrency control, right? So this is the kind of stuff you'd see in Calvin or Foundation DB. Uh, or probably percolator, and basically any database that's not based on spanner or two-phase commit and two-phase locking, right? So you have a timestamp oracle, choose the timestamp for the transaction. We fork a snapshot of the database and we run the transaction on that snapshot. And now we have um, a lot of multi, we have um, copy on write multi-version data structures that allow us to do this very efficiently. While the transaction is running, we track the read sets of all the data it's observed including range scans and index predicates. So we don't have any phantom reads. Uh, 
Then when the transaction is finished, we check if we can commit it at the latest timestamp. We know a transaction can commit if no concurrent rights have touched anything in the read set. And if so, reassign the timestamp to the latest time, commit the transaction, return the result. Otherwise, we retry. Um, I've gone through this very fast. We're not necessarily innovating in this space here. And you can read more about this, you know, go read, say, how Foundation DB works or, you know, how Percolator works, et cetera. So probably the most interesting thing about the transaction model is that we rely very heavily on these read sets and read sets store all the data you've observed in a transaction. They include both point reads, but also range scans on tables and indexes. And so if you don't have range scans, you might have phantom reads where um, you know, a, an item gets inserted in, in the middle of a table scan that you've, you've, you've observed. So read sets are the basis for transaction coordination, for deciding whether the transaction can commit, but they're also used as the basis for caching and subscriptions, which we'll talk about soon. So they need to be very fast. And so we've designed a couple of data structures to make this efficient. So read sets are stored in a data structure called a range set, a range set similar to an interval tree data structure. And they store a bunch of ranges and give you a very fast intersection operation to see if a point or range intersects with this. So if there's an intersection between two ranges, there's a conflict, we abort the transaction. We also need to perform the reverse query quite frequently as well. We just say, given a set of rights, give me all the current ranges it intersects with. And we do this via a structure we're calling a range map and it involves talking about subscriptions though. So I'm gonna get into what subscriptions are. So one of the stronger features I think in our system is the subscription functionality. We've found them really quite powerful in developing apps. Often when you're writing a dynamic web app, you wanna re-render the elements on the screen when new data changes, when the data changes, the query changes and there's new results to show. Um, so if we look at our old list messages example, this is a query that would implement something like a Slack clone or a chat app. So it's basically saying, give me all the messages in this channel. And this is all well and good, but new messages are gonna show up all the time, which means typically you need to keep polling this function over and over. And this is inefficient, it's slow, it puts excess load in the database and it's complexity the developer doesn't wanna think about. So with Convex, you can use subscriptions to do this automatically. So you, you render some elements in the DOM, so you render all your chat messages as the basis of a query. Then if any data changes that invalidates that query, meaning any new chat message gets posted, which will invalidate the subscription and will redraw those elements on the page dynamically. So this is the code for a chat app in Convex. Um, this is actual real code. Um, it's actually mostly one line. It's mostly this use query line. And what this is doing is binding the list messages function. So this function here, which is like the, the stored procedure. It's binding the output of list messages to a variable called messages. Right? And anytime messages changes, um, React will re-render the chat view, which will re-render a whole bunch of new messages for you. Right? So we do this over a web socket um, and I'll show you basically how this works. So subscriptions leverage our read sets, which is why we need them to be very efficient. So every time you run a query in the system, we end up with a read set and a timestamp for that query. And we serialize these and encrypt them into a token while making sure we don't leak any private states. So the, the client library gets a token back for this um, transaction, this, this read transaction. The client can then subscribe to that token. So to do, basically you send the token to the server, say I wanna subscribe on this token, which opens a web socket. And then if, the, if anything changes to invalidate the results of that query, we can use this web socket to send the new, mess new, new messages down. So internally, we store all the active subscriptions. So every active subscription, every web socket is stored uh, in the range map. Every time a new write commits in the system, we check all the active subscriptions. We see if there's a conflict. We have to do this very efficiently. Um, so if there's a conflict, it means a write intersects with any of the read sets for an active subscription. If so, we invalidate the subscription, rerun the transaction, send the new results down. So that will give you all the new chat messages automatically. Um, we actually rerun the, query, the full query each time. So this is a bit different to say materialize, which does a lot of work with partial results. Uh, there's nothing stopping us uh, using partial results here, just not something we've implemented yet. 
if, um, the cat, the, the, yeah, go for Andy. Like, maybe you said this and I missed this. You say you're doing complex transactions, but like the example you keep showing is like one query, like on one table, right? Like, yes. How would you be able to take the output of one query and put it into another query? Again, in the context yeah. of a single transaction. Yeah, this is, this is probably a bad, I just pick a bad example. So we have tons of these and basically you might say, um, the, the, the JavaScript code could say, let, um, look up a user. So, you know, it takes an email address and say user equals, you know, um, you know, db.table users dot filter, you, you know, email equals blah dot, you know, first you get the user ID, then you get your subsequent request. So basically this is, this is full JavaScript, right? You can go and look up a user, look up the, the, the channels it's a member of, um, you know, um, you know, look up the messages in those channels. Right? Okay, so and so basically- the, all, the function is what's getting shipped over to the server and that's the transaction, not the db.table call. No, sorry, yeah, so thank you for asking okay. the question. The entire function source code is what runs on the server. All right, sorry, right? Yeah, I missed that. that yeah, yeah that's, that's a very, very good point. Um, yeah, so, the, so you, you might have a very big library, you know, like basically, you know, if you're running a more complex app, especially if it has access control, the first thing you do typically is look up a user, look up what, you know, tables as a member of, et cetera. You know, you have a bunch of calls to the database and the entire function runs server-side in our V8 isolate. And only when it calls DB stuff do we break out of V8 and go back to our, our, our Rust code, basically. So you're running all this code and, and the DB is basically like a little escape hatch to, to get out to the transaction state from the database back, back to JavaScript and then returns the result. That's the great question, Any thanks. Um, so caching, I mentioned earlier that it's really important that caching works well. This is becoming a really big selling point. It actually su surprised me with how big a selling point this is. If you look at um, all these um, services, um, you know, Netlify, Vercel, um, you know, unsurprisingly Cloudflare, but um, they're all pushing the selling point of CDNs and edge computing, getting reads close to your users. Um, there's a lot of demand for really high performance read queries. And fortunately, if we actually know what the transactions are doing, we can actually do a great job of consistent caching. So right now we have caching on the back end. Um, it's not a big job to add caching on edge proxies as well, and we can leverage subscriptions to do so. So basically how caching works is, you know, we don't use memcache, but you can imagine something like every function request that comes in, we, we dump, we run, run the query, dump the result in the LRU cache, and we map and basically the function name, the function inputs to the result and the token. Okay. Then when a query comes in, we look in the cache and see, hey, is, is there any cache result that has that function and the same inputs? We get the token back in the result. We check if that token is still valid. So check if that read set has been invalidated. If it hasn't been invalidated, the cache results correct and we can return it to the user. Okay. If not, we just run the, run the query. Now, there are a few complications with caching. For example, we have to expire results that aren't timely from a wall clock perspective. And so the example query I like to use here is like this query to give me all the overdue library books, right? So the overdue library book query, I didn't write it out, but it looks something like, hey, you know, give me all the books in this table where the return date is less than the current system time. And if we just cache that query by default, it will never get invalidated, right? Because it's pinned at a certain walk clock time, right? at the time the query was executed. Uh, so we have time-based invalidation also. So we throw away old results if the time, if the time is you know, too old, older than a few seconds. But we only do so if the query is actually accessed the system time. Most queries don't access system time, right? And we can cache them forever as so long as the read set's valid. And only if we, because we're running the transaction ourselves, we can just check if, that, if the query ever access the system time. If so, we don't have to keep it in the cache for too long. So I wanted to use caching as an example to kind of make a point about composable abstraction. This is going to be a bit philosophical here. Um, but um, after I did a bit of refactoring in the code base, caching took me about a day to implement. Um, and so why is that? I'm a tell you right now, I'm not a super fast coder, right? And caching is quite sophisticated. It's, it's, it's transactionally correct caching. And this is the kind of project that would often take a very long time to implement in most databases. 
And the reason why I think it was easy, because I like to think we've come up with a set of highly composable abstractions and a composable abstraction are those that fit together cleanly when you can add new functionality without adding complexity. And oftentimes you're surprised that things can't just work. And one example of a very composable abstraction is that we store the metadata for the database in the database itself, right? So the source code, the JavaScript source code for all these stored procedures gets stored in the database in a table. It's a special system table, but it's in that regular database, right? So when the function executes, the first thing it has to do is read the source code, right? Which means the source code ends up in the read set for that transaction. Now you might say one concern with caching is you know, you can change these stored procedures all the time, right? You can, you can upgrade them. They might have a long chain of dependencies and a dependency gets upgraded, right? So you might worry what happens if we return the result of a, um, return a cached result that's been generated by an old version of the code. And ordinarily you'd build a lot of checks in there. You'd have code version numbers and you'd make sure we're running these things in the latest version. But in this case, we don't need that at all, right? Because if the code has been upgraded, since that, since that cache result was generated, it'll be a read set conflict, right? Because the first thing the function did was read its own source code, right? So, so an abstraction like this allows us to eliminate a lot of complexity, right? Um, there's countless examples in the system where just that little decision to store our own metadata in our own system has made um, implementing uh, the system a lot more simple. Now, I see the chat message coming through. Um, I'm gonna, Stephen, do you wanna read out the message, yourself, the question yourself? Sure. Um, one of the key you mentioned is the system needs to ship the source code of the uh, the JavaScript to run on the server side. And it's kind of the recent problem in the NPN space is there are a lot of package squatting, namespace squatting. And if one of your customer's package is infected and they say, oh shit, like we, we have a developer sneak into a bad infected package. Like, of course, now they have a security vulnerability, maybe you know, so they have the recorded package, like how much cash would it destroy in your systems? Yeah, I mean, so, that, so there's a few things to from that question. So um, the context is that, that packaging in JavaScript is really annoying and NPM is, is quite difficult to work with. And so we have a bundler. So the first, the first step in answering that question is we have a bundler. So when you write a function, you may have all these dependencies and they might refer to different versions of packages that are put in by NPM and sometimes the same code might talk with two different versions of a dependency and the same function somehow. Um, but um, so we have a bundler that, that oh, it's a Webpack-esque thing, which, which bundles up the function and ships it to the server, right? Um, then we run the, um, the code in an isolated, isolated V8 environment. So it can't touch data that belongs to other customers and it can't um, break out of access controls. So we have actual, I'm not gonna talk about access controls in this talk, but we have access controls on top of this. Um, as to whether you could write bad code and it do the wrong thing to your database, yeah, that can happen, right? Um, just like you can write a bad SQL query that has a, a drop table statement in it, right? And so um, the, the, the key here is having an actual development process, like a, a stage rollout process where you can actually test these things before they roll out. I, I don't cover it in this talk, but we also have a, like a, um, development workflow where you know you push things first to a staging instance and you can run this on the fork of the data and make sure it's correct. Um, but essentially, yes, if you have a bad query, you can do bad things for your data. And this is, a, I guess, a tension you bring up between expressivity and safety, right? The more expressive your query language is, the more things it can do. Yeah. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, cool. So one principle we'll talk about, we care about a lot in the system is incrementality. And this is the ability to start with something simple and approachable and then extend it over time to something more sophisticated in a way that doesn't feel happy, right? So we'll talk about schemas. And, and then generally there's two approaches to schemas, right? There's the Mongo and the Firebase approach, which is kind of dump a bunch of JSON in a table or a collection. And this works great at first. This gets a lot of traction with developers because it's easy to use. But oftentimes later on, they regret the lack of schema enforcement. And then you have the more traditional database approach where you define your schema before you get started. Um, oftentimes, before you get started, you don't even know what schema you need, right? And, 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 and this is not very compatible with early stage product, product development. So we support both in our system. So you can just dump your JSON into the system, but everything is actually fully typed internally. And then you can codify the schemas incrementally. So when you write data to the system, 
We track each row you insert and we compute the union type of all the data you have in a given table, right? So we have this phrase, uh, least upper bound in the type lattice. That sounds very complicated, I guess it is. But we basically compute the simplest possible union type that can represent data in the table. Here's a very simple example, a very, very simple example because schemas can be a lot more complex than this. And this is just basic pseudocode. So first you're inserting an object in the system. It's an object with one field called name and it has a value called hello. And so the type for that table in the system is an object mapping name to a string. And then you insert another object and it has a name field which maps to an int, seven. Right? So then automa our automatic um, schema um, tracking now says the schema for this system is the union type of int or string. And then if you go and delete the original row, so there's no longer any, um, any strings in that table, right? The type changes to an int, right? So this gives us a lot of uh, flexibility. Basically what happens is you start writing data to your system and you can see at any time the union type that represents what's actually in your table. Um, I'm actually not gonna tell you how we do that. I'm just gonna keep this as like a magic secret sauce. You know? <laughs> maybe, you can, maybe you can give me a thing to talk about uh, later on. Um, so schema migrations. Um, so the data is all typed, right? And if you actually want to enforce schema rules, you can just go and codify the schema. And say, yeah, I actually want this to be name mapping to an int. Codify it and we'll enforce it. What if you want to change your schema? Uh, schema migrations are a huge pain in most databases. Um, online schema migration usually doesn't work, in my experience, at least in, say, MySQL. Um, off, generally what you do, even in very large companies, if you want to make a change to a schema, even something simple like changing a table name or dropping a column, is you make an entire clone of the table, which costs a lot of money because you need hardware to do it. You make an offline change to the schema, you sync it up to date with the latest data, and then you promote the clone to the new primary. And this can take months for charter databases. I've seen this take quarters. Um, schema migration is a huge problem. It's clearly a problem because the planet scale folks who have a lot of experience running databases, uh, they make this one of the biggest selling points. So the planet scale onboarding is really quite good, the onboarding docs. And the, one of the big pitches is the, that you can fork the schema and, um, and you can test schema migrations, et cetera. So in convex schema migration is a bit different. You just define a migration function and you're done. So you write a function, for example, that takes a union type of int and string, returns an int equivalent, and that's just schema migration. We run it in real time. So there's actually no reason why this has to be run in the background. There's no reason we have to kind of pause the database and, and process all the data, right? If everything's stored in a consistent serial log and uh, we can track which data has been migrated. And if you try to read data that hasn't been migrated, we can just in time translate it. We can do this in real time. There's complexities there around maintaining multiple indexes, et cetera. Okay. Um, but having that information um, the type information makes it very easy for us to do schema migrations. I'm just going to pause here. I think there's a question in the chat. No, nope, we're all good. Um, so, so I mean, your schemas are just tight. You, you can't do like not nulls, constraints, other things. Like, uh, not, not nulls. Oh, um, uh, scheme enforcement. Uh, yeah, so basically um, the schema will track if there's nulls. So like the, Internal, we have two concepts, shapes and schemas, right? So the union type is actually a shape, right? So we understand all the data that's been put in there. So if you have um, two objects, one that you know um, maps name to a field and other maps address to a field, right? Name is gonna be string or null and the rest is gonna be um, you know, string or null, right? Uh, then when you do the enforcement, yes, you can make it not null basically. But um, what I've been talking about really is shapes, which is type understanding. Once you have that type understanding, you can you can run predicates against it and enforce predicates. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess as a follow up question, the, the the way you've been describing schema so far is you directly infer it from the data. I guess typically the way we learn about schemas is, is you define a schema and then the database informs it, it enforces the structure of the data. So I guess is yeah. there a reason why that's are, are you guys doing that or is there a reason why you guys are Choosing this bottom-up approach. There's a, I mean, there's there's really no reason why we couldn't add that as a feature if you wanted. There's no reason why we couldn't just you know allow you to define your schema a priori. It, you know, it's in days worth of work probably. Um, it's a deliberate 
uh, design decision to start in an incremental fashion, right? So to be able to like you know, write your system, uh, typically what you're doing is you know you're, you're you're writing software in JavaScript, right? You're writing functions. You know, basically, typically your, your schema really when you're a developer is codified not in the database. Your schema is codified in the TypeScript types that you're using, right? So basically, you know, you 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 have a chat message and there's a message type in TypeScript, right? So you can write that message type to the server and we'll basically infer the shape based on what you've uploaded, right? And you can codify that. There's nothing preventing us also then saying, if a priori you want to go and actually, you know, predefine the schema, that's no problems. Just in our experience with the kind of the, the demands from the developers are normally the other way around, that they just want to kind of define their types locally uh, as you know, TypeScript types and then have the database, you know, eventually allow them to codify them. That, is that cover things, uh, Eugene? Thanks. Yep. Um, cool. So scaling out, um, scaling out the system is something I'm not going to talk about a lot today uh, because there's fairly standard ways of doing this. And again, you can go look at um, Foundation or um, um, Calvin, Fauna, Percolator, these systems, how they scale out. The systems that have a centralized time, st time stamp oracle and how they scale out. So basically, your serialization path has to be semi-centralized, right? Typically, um, if that centralized service, all it's doing is, is you know, assigning timestamps and, and checking read sets, you can support um, almost any customer load on a single replicated machine. You can scale that out as needed. It's extremely rare that a customer can, can, can outstrip the, you know, timestamp assignment uh, bandwidth of a single, of the single replicated cluster. Uh, so once you've got your critical path doing your, you know, your actual transaction coordination, everything else can be farmed out, right? So you can put your caching and indexing servers on SSD hosts. You can move the execution close to the data. And actually the underlying data can then sit on an object store um, and have, you know, in the latest versions are cached uh, on, on SSDs. Um, ultimately, not too many customers need a giant distributed database. Uh, if they do need a giant distributed database, oftentimes it's, it's used for analytical use cases. We bring this to this last primitive, which is the escape hatch. So we don't want to replace every analytical tool or business intelligence integration, at least for now. Uh, it's far easy, uh, easy just to you know, play nice with these systems, so allow them to, to access your underlying data. So it's also a pretty bad idea generally to mix OLTP and OLAP workloads. They have very different access characteristics. This affects conflicts, buffer sizing, resource allocation. And that's okay. We don't have to um, solve all the problems at once because there's an object store underneath that stores the escape hatch. So basically, at the bottom of that system is a column store, right? All the clever fast stuff happens on our, like, you know, implementation and our SSDs and, and expensive machines. Uh, at the end of the day, the data is just dumped on an object store. Totally happy for folks to point their, you know, the analytics cluster at it um, or, you know, or use a SQL interface to query. Um, now I've got a section here this on this is the live data, data. like the, the, the live data is in a column store, or this is like you you have like an export function. It's it, it's, it's flush, yeah, asynchronously, yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. And it's and you just um, parquet files or what format? Uh yeah, parquet obviously we're 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 actually messing around with it right now. So yeah. Okay. Standard form, yeah, yeah. Um we, we've in the past, yeah, used um either parquet or OSC. Yeah. I have a question. Does your database is launching with change data capture support, or you're always going to have to do a batch based export, or you're just using timestamp to expect to export the micro increment, the micro batching the incremental changes back into the object store? Which route are we, you? Um, we are we we we're launching without any of that. So I mean, and 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 just for, for context, I mentioned this at the very start, but like we have like. Um, a bunch of features that are going to stage out as time goes on, right? So the initial the initial release um, basically will have the JavaScript query engine, will have caching, will have subscriptions, has type support, does not expose uh, codification of schemas yet, so it just has shape support, um, and doesn't support doesn't expose the kind of objects. Well, and those are things that we have to kind of stage out as time goes on because the startup and we're we're gaining experience as we go what what resonates, and we kind of want to launch these features incrementally get feedback of what people are really liking and we have to you know, make, make changes as we go. So the answer is, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. For your SQL interface, is that like a future thing? You, you don't support it yet? 
we um we had it we deleted it um we were okay. put it back in and, and and so in terms of uh, actual um we also had a graphql uh, interface for this and this is an interesting aside um when we started working on this we thought there'd be a lot of demand for graphql as a query language um and so we have a, a, a graphql endpoints allow value to you know as an alternative to a to a javascript function just use graphql um our experience has been the graphql um probably everyone knows this but you know nice convenient query language pretty um pretty clumsy um write language right to, to do mutation the graphql is pretty difficult to write efficient queries in graphql is a little bit tricky and our experience has been that there has not been a lot of customer demand so far for like a for graphql um so that stuff's just been pulled out for now we're going to launch without it um but yeah these are things that we can layer back onto the system as, as needed. And, and, and curiosity, like the SQL interface you had before, is that like homegrown or is it like you put a Postgres foreign data wrapper in front of something? Like it was a native, it was a, it was a, it was the off the shelf wrapper. Um, on, and we had a, a, a translation uh, layer. And to be honest, I forget, um, I forget which one we used because um, my co founder, Sue J, implemented that, that part. I totally forget um, what, what the layer was. Yeah. I, I, I can Thank follow you. up and I can follow up and let you know. It's not urgent, it's curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So now we're, we're at like a turning point in the talk because I have a section on testing, which I think is quite interesting, but um, I can give a whole other talk on it. And so we've got 10 minutes left, left, right, Andy? So maybe it might make sense to pause for questions. Um, I can talk you know, more about things. I'll actually skip forward to where are we towards, um, you know. I, I, I mean, I'm very curious about testing. Okay, yeah. Well, let's power through testing and I'll try to... Um, to, to, you know, cover what we can. Um, you and like, hey, you have like you have like twelve minutes. Twelve minutes, no problems. We got this. Let's, let's go. Okay. So I, I actually put this in because I know Andy. I knew Andy likes testing, um, and it's actually quite relevant to us because if, if you want an abstraction to hold, it has to be sound. It has to be correct. If if your system is not correct, all of a sudden the abstraction falls apart, and the developer has to understand what goes on inside. You know, ask me how many Dropbox developers know the internals of MySQL. It's a lot, right? Because there's weird bugs and stuff and you have to learn how these things work. We want this to be a very sound abstraction. I've given a lot of talks on testing, um, uh, heavily involved in it as an engineer. And I typically believe the best approach is to adopt multiple layers of testing. Um, and I'll talk about all three layers. So the first is algorithmic testing. Our algorithmic testing, yes, it's unit testing. There's also some more sophisticated techniques for evaluating correctness of algorithms and data structures within your code. And so human beings are pretty bad at writing test cases. Partly why is because they often bake their own oversights into the tests themselves. So the test will pass, but they're testing the thing that you expect. So there's a system called Quick Check. Quick Check. Um, can you hear me still, Andy, by the way? Yeah, you're back. Sorry, you froze for a second. My, my connection dropped off. Yep, great. Um, quick check came out of the Haskell community, I think back in 2000. Um, a lot of our work is actually influenced by Haskell and, and determinism. So quick check is basically files testing. You define properties for a function that have to be upheld, and you construct a testing library how to construct random inputs of that function, and then it runs that function over millions of, of inputs to see if it can trigger any bugs. So here's a simple but very powerful example. This is copied and pasted out of our code base. So this is real code. Um, this is a test that a value, so the value type in our system is this type structure that can be very nested and quite complex. This is a test that the value can be serialized to JSON and then deserialized back from JSON and it gives the same result back. Right? So this query says, you know, take the value, serialize it, deserialize it, making sure it equals to the original value. And this might seem like a very straightforward test. Uh, we've actually used this to find bugs because uh, serialization is quite a complicated task, uh, especially with stuff like floating point numbers and um, NANs, like not the numbers, gets quite difficult. Um, so this has been a very useful test and it's basically one line of code. Right? So I'm just glossing over an important detail here is that you can tell QuickCheck, hey, run this on a whole bunch of inputs and it will tell you whether it works or not. We have to tell QuickCheck how to construct a random input, right? And this is this function called arbitrary here. This is the function signature for arbitrary. Um, and there's quite an art to implementing arbitrary as you might expect, 
right? Since arbitrary has to kind of just implement some kind of random distribution of values for your inputs, but those that random distribution should focus more on the corner cases, right? So if you're testing floating point numbers, you probably want to test more numbers around zero and negative zero, negative numbers, or you know, um, not nands or numbers at the extreme, right? So there's a bit of an art and thought that has to go into designing arbitrary implementations. This is kind of a pro tip we've found is when you're implementing a structure, say like range set, or we have some really kind of um, clever, efficient lexicographical ordering of types um, that, that um, are very fast, but they're actually quite complex algorithms. What we actually do is first write a really brain dead version of the algorithm. We write a very simple version of the algorithm. We test this, make sure we're, we're, we believe that it works. And then we use quick check to validate that the simple version of the algorithm and a complex algorithm give the same, same result. And this has been a very powerful technique. The third thing I'll say is these libraries give a support for minimization. So generally, if you have a complex failure case, they'll be able to automatically pull, um, uh, pull inputs out of this to try and find the most, the minimum possible reproduction of the error case. It's an exponential time process, but we find it yields good results. So this is the maybe more interesting part, which is a bit more maybe area where we're innovating. Right? So we have a system called Pedant, which is the integration test version of QuickCheck, basically. Right? So you need to do end-to-end -end testing for your system. So basically Pedant runs pathological workloads on the database and ensures the execution of these workloads is correct. But life is a lot harder in, um, integration testing with the distributed systems because you have to introduce errors, such as a node failure or network drop. But you also have to examine all the interleavings of execution threads and RPCs in your system, right? which is something that almost no one does. The Foundation DB team did a great job of this and they did, wrote a lot of work on this. Um, they actually have a startup on testing right now. Um, at Dropbox, we did a lot of work on this in the, the desktop client. And there's a blog post that's great. You can read called Testing Sync at Dropbox. But the reason why this is both so powerful and why mostly no one does it is because it's very hard to do, almost infeasible to do so, unless you've built your implementation around this technique. And so what you need to do is have what we're calling a virtualized runtime, right? So what we want to do is basically allow threads and, and tasks to interleave deterministically in test, right? So a runtime is a structure that we pass around our code base, right? And anytime you want to access a system time, you have to ask the runtime for a system time. In prod, it will just give you the system time. In dev, it'll give you a fake time that you can manually increment. Right? Every time you want to spawn an execution task, uh, you have to act, call the runtime to do so, right? In prod, it will just spawn a, you know, spawn a future and, and run it. Uh, in, in, in test, it will basically allow you to, to, to manually adjust the schedule of these tasks. Um, so you know, we run into a lot of complexities here, like V8, for example, is one complexity because V8 expects to run in its own execution thread. Because they're going to have time slices we give the V8 to run within. But um, this is a really powerful technique, right? Allows us to, to validate that you know, correctness of a distributed system, basically. But it has to be built into the design of the system. You have to invest in an a priori. You can't take a database and slap this on afterwards. It's too difficult. And the last thing in testing is production validation. It's the thing I'm kind of most passionate about. I think a lot of people don't care about that much. Uh, at the end of the day, we're selling an abstraction. And that abstraction is if you put data in your system and you query it back, you get the correct results. And that abstraction breaks down if, you know, if the data is not correct. Right? And anytime, anyone who spent a lot of time with large databases will tell you that there's a lot of complexity to deal with, a lot of anomalies, a lot of incorrect data. And like the real um, the dirty truth is that most systems you interact with on the internet have bad data in them. Right? They have bad data in them because of bit flips or CPU logic errors or bugs or some old migration from half a decade ago. Right? And there's some systems that don't. Um, I can tell you Magic Pocket, the storage system with Dropbox does not have any corrupt data in it whatsoever. Right? And that's only because of systems where engineers have invested in a very, very thorough validation process that continually scans over the data in production and make sure that it's correct, right? It's interesting from an operational perspective, but also from a database design perspective, because it means it's important to design systems that are easily validated. And typically systems that are built on like a linearized serialized log, write ahead log, these are a good fit for validation 
because you can walk over the log, make sure the data is correct. You know, that looks like what you expect it to be. Systems based on eventual synchrony or distributed hash tables are typically a poor fit for production validation because it's be very hard to determine a basis what is correct in the system. And so this is a whole hour long talk I can give about this. There's like three shout outs to things I've written here. There's a blog um, post, um, there's a talk and there's a book chapter. <laughs> and so if, you, if you're an operational person that runs databases in production, uh, you know, I'd encourage you to read that. So that's Convex. Uh, it's a database we're building. It's launching very soon, a couple of weeks. Supports native JavaScript, JavaScript transactions, built-in caching, automatic subscriptions, schema migrations, an incrementally deployable feature set. But most importantly, we believe it makes databases more usable for developers because it provides them the abstractions that we think they need to ignore what's going on inside the databases. And that's that. Oh, I will clap on behalf of everyone else. Uh, we have a time for a few questions. So Stephen has a question in chat, but I want to open up anybody else before yes. We go to Stephen's question. Anybody else has a question? Stephen, go for it. Is Convex ready for the Jepson test yet? Uh, no, not yet. I mean, but we'd be totally happy to do so. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too soon. But, I mean, it's not relevant because we have a lot more features to come. And I think, it, you know, we can we have a third party run test. Um, but we have to, they have to redo it anyway as we, as we add more features. Uh, but yeah, I think some of the testing you do is a little bit similar. And it may it's more comprehensive because it's much easier to test a system that's built around testing than a system that's not. Yeah. What is the backend database system? So you mentioned Rust. Like, is it 100% written from scratch or are you guys plopping in RocksDB? Like, what, did you write your own storage manager? Like what does is, what is the backend server sort of look like? Uh, the, most of the work is on the transaction coordinator course, um, yes. and that's in Rust. And so we're, we're um, well, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a prototype version that's actually just using um, Postgres in the backend, but we're replacing, replacing that eventually. Um, but yeah, it's, it's basically, you can think of the, the secret source, the magic is mostly in the transaction, the read sets, the transaction coordination, the multi-version concurrency control. Um, we've all like built this stuff before, meaning like we've built object stores and stuff before. We don't really want to do that again if we can avoid it. Um, and the, so it's, it's unlikely we're going to build a distributed storage system, right? We'll build a distributed caching system and correct transaction coordination, transaction coordination system. But yes, I mean, ultimately, um, we, we plan on just and, and, you know, letting the customer decide whether the object store goes into S3 or Google Cloud Storage and, and then um, we'll use as much off the shelf kind of database table management stuff as we can. And then, does that mean also then like you are, like, again, it's serverless, the, the, the customer doesn't see that they're provisioning machines, but you, you have to route it somewhere. So like- Yes, just, we, we yeah, do provision right. live, yes. Yeah, so um, right now we can, we can get a backend up in a couple of seconds. Um, we can, I'm sure we can make it quite a faster. And so in, in practice, what, this, what, this, what happens is we have a development flow. We have a, um, a program called the Convex Client. So you have NPX, Convex init to create a new database instance, Convex push to push your source code to the back end. When you call Convex init, it, it provisions live to the database. We can do that really quite fast. Most of the delays and stuff like setting up DNS records and um, you know, most of the, it, it's actually really quite fast in terms of, um, of spinning up the back end itself. It sounds like right now you assume that one customer equals one node and therefore you don't have to worry about distributed transactions spanning nodes. I mean, you're set up to support it, but it sounds like you, you just, you're not doing that now. Yes, yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. very good. Um, and my last question is like, so with Rust, uh, surprising that again, for, it, it, you're only implementing the transaction layer in Rust, but you didn't choose Go and a lot of the, a lot of like the cockroaches and those kind of guys are using Go. So I guess you can talk a little bit about like, what is being yeah. great about, what's that? That this is, you know, I actually wrote a blog post on this, Andy, like a couple of days ago, uh, oh, okay. why, why Rust and like, um, yeah, so, so um, I, I, we might've talked about this in the past, but I'm, I'm, like, I'm traditionally more of a Go developer, right? A lot, most of the Magic Pocket was written in Go. The storage engine was written in Rust and the desktop client rewrite was written in Rust. So most of my co-founders are kind of, 
the, the, the Rust pros. Um, I think what has been really powerful for us in Rust, a few things. One is, is very tight control over um, runtime overhead. Right, so, so knowing exactly how many resources we're allocating has been a huge, huge win. The type system has been massive, right? Um, massive assistance. Um, one thing I, I, I wrote in this blog post is that what we've found in the past is when we've prototyped systems in Go, we've often written a prototype and thrown it away and started again once we knew what we were doing. In Rust, we've found that we're able to kind of refactor our prototype into the system that we want. Because just refactoring in Rust is so much easier than Go. Like refast, re, Rust's refactoring is, is off the charts uh, powerful compared to a language that that strong type system. Typically in Rust, you make a change and then you just follow the compile errors and until the errors are fixed, and generally just works. Right? Rust is also far more conducive with um, some of that kind of testing strategies around it. You know, it can, it can be done in other languages, but um, being able to have much more control over, over the over the the lack of a runtime. You know, we have our own virtualized runtime. Um, so yes, we could have written this in Go, absolutely. Uh, I am a bit faster in Go, I would say, but um, the other folks are, are faster in Rust and um, certainly have no regrets. Um, I think it's, it's been great. And the other thing I found is that is the, is the standard libraries in Rust really quite mature. I mean, I think the people who, because it's a smaller community, uh, they tend to be kind of higher quality, kind of more focused set of, uh, of libraries and, and, and kind of crates as they're called in the Rust community. So um, Rust has been a great choice. Um, if people are thinking about switching languages in their company and like switching from Go to Rust, um, you got to be careful. There's a lot of cost that comes with that and you can go to the convex.dev blog and I have a blog post about times you may not actually want to switch languages and whether the, the, the overhead of doing so is too onerous.